Fala pessoal, tudo certo? Nós vamos começar hoje o Historiar-se em 2022 com um grande estilo, seguindo com a nossa playlist sobre trabalhar com história hoje, que é uma parceria que nós temos feito com o Tem Profissional da História aí, para falar sobre as diferentes possibilidades de atuação de um historiador ou de uma historiadora hoje em dia. Para começar com um grande estilo, a gente vai falar hoje sobre história pública e nós vamos entrevistar o professor Thomas Calvin, que é professor da Universidade de Luxemburgo e presidente de uma das maiores organizações de, histórias, de história pública em nível internacional. A entrevista foi toda feita em inglês e aí para acessar as legendas, uh, vocês podem ir aqui na barra de baixo, onde tem a opção de pausar, de mexer nas configurações, enfim, vocês podem acionar as legendas, que eu vou colocá-las em português, e aí fica mais tranquilo de assistir ao vídeo, certo? Até o próximo vídeo e tchau, tchau! Professor, could you talk a little about the work developed by the International Federation of Public History? and its importance for the formation of international networks of public historians. So the International Federation for Public History was created in 2011, so it's about 10 years. And the main objective has been to connect people who do public history, projects, uh, centers, practitioners all over the world. Because public history by then was very much present in North America, in other places too, but there was a lack of, of connection. So we've been very um, uh, careful to connect and to provide events in different parts of the world. For example, we've had conferences in, in, in Europe, but also in, in Colombia in 2016, in Bogota, in, in Sao Paulo, in Brazil in 2018 in, in China, so that we, we go beyond North America and we, we also create more resources in, in Spanish, in Portuguese, in French, in German, because we, we think it's very important to develop public history in other languages, right? And uh, we've been influenced by many different networks. And in Brazil, there is a huge network of public history and public historians. So we've learned a lot from them too. And we've also, try to develop public history as a solid and a valid field of historical studies. So we created in 2018 a, a journal, a peer-reviewed journal, International Public History for historians and other scholars to publish about public history in a peer-reviewed journal, which is very important for uh, a field to be acknowledged. We are also very careful and very um, willing to develop teaching resources. So we just uh, last week uh, published uh, a document, a guideline on how to create public history master program to help universities and colleagues to develop new courses and new programs. We've also shared some syllabi and courses in Spanish, in Polish, in Portuguese to help colleagues who want to uh, teach public history to have already some resources in different languages. And perhaps the last aspect of the International Federation has been to help local networks. For example, last year we helped, I mean, we helped, we contributed to create the, the Spanish uh, National Association of Public History in 2020. The Italian Association for Public History was created in 2016. And if we've been supporting uh, the Brazilian network, Uh, the, the present network of, of public history. They don't really don't help, but we connect them with other colleagues. So that's something we like to do. And we, that's one of our objectives to support local initiatives for public history. What are the impacts of digital history and new technologies for the development of public history, mainly from the perspective of the public history as a new citizen science of the past project and the work developed by the Center for Contemporary and Digital History. I think, and I'm not the only one, but I think digital tools and digital technology has had and will have a tremendous impact on how we do public history. The, the first obvious consequence is that the digital tools help historians, but also practitioners, curators, art, archivists, to communicate history to a broad audience. So historians and practitioners can use 
podcasts, uh, blogs, websites, story maps to communicate research and reach people who may not want to read books or manuscripts or academic journals. So that, that there's a very obvious need and tool to communicate history. That, that's why I often teach my students to create podcasts, to create story maps, to create um, web documentaries, because we need more historians able and capable to communicate history through digital media. So I think the digital tools and technology impacts public history and helps historians to communicate history. And in Brazil, you have many uh, fantastic examples of, of, of podcasts, of uh, Café Historia, the Historia da Dictatura, uh, very successful in communicating history beyond uh, university and beyond academy. So that, that's one of the, the main assets of digital tools for, for historians. It's also about participation, and this is slightly more challenging, but digital tools and digital technology in the spirit of Wikipedia, for example, can help to develop participatory practices in public history. Through crowdsourcing or citizen science, we can develop projects that, in which historians contribute with local amateurs or community groups or experts in other fields to do history together. So it's uh, user-centered, so the user is at the center of the project. It's also sometimes user generated. So like Wikipedia, the users can create knowledge. So it has many challenges, but it's also a very um, engaging way of doing public history. Because I, I think that historians and, and practitioners are confronted with one big problem. With the internet, everybody can access everything. And this is, uh, this is the beauty of, of digital too, but that's also the big challenge because the voices of historians are, I would say, part, a, a tiny part of, 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 of the internet, right? People can find anything from everybody and it's very difficult for users to make a difference between a good history and a pure op opinion because everything is on the same level on the internet. And that's a, a major challenge for historians especially when they don't know how to uh, communicate on, on the internet, when they don't master the skills of doing a podcast or doing a, a story map or doing a video. So that's, again, why we need to train our students to master those skills, mm -hmm. to be able to communicate their research and to occupy the, the internet, right? Because that, that's one of the main challenges for students to occupy the public sphere. And very often the sphere is, is occupied by other people who are not historians, they may be doing good things, but sometimes they don't, uh, but they have the skills to communicate uh, some ideological uh, opinion about the past. And it's very difficult for historians to fight those people because they don't have the same tools. So this is uh, the, the digital tools can help historians and, and curators, archivists to be heard. To reframe on the, the Center for Contemporary and Digital History, where I work at the University of Luxembourg, we are very good in, in doing digital history. We, we have a new digital history journal that was launched last month. And we have many uh, experts in doing you know, history online, doing digital uh, history. We are also pretty good at doing virtual exhibition, which is one of the tools that historians should be able to use to communicate uh, their, their work. But more and more, we, we try to work on... Uh, on crowdsourcing and what I would call kind of citizen history. And this is my project. So FACTS, that, uh, that stands for uh, Public History as the New Citizen Science of the Past. And the, the basic idea is to be inspired by citizen science. So the fact of doing uh, science, art science, usually it's astrology and art science in, in a citizen spirit. So citizens contributing to science. So I want to imply and apply this to public history and making citizens, and citizens may be misleading because not everybody is citizen, but they can participate um, into making history, in, into what we could call citizen history, in the sense that citizens are part of, of the production. So we have, we have projects of um, collecting archives, 
with, uh, with citizens and users, especially for the, the COVID-19. This is one of the projects we have. But it's also sometimes more analog uh, projects. For example, we want to design a fresco, so a wall murals, so a painting on a mural in a participatory way. So we're going to work with artists and we're going to work with inhabitants of the neighborhood to design a fresco together. There's nothing digital, but the, the process is very much citizen science because we're going to help translate the memories and the, the, the witness, the experiences from the local inhabitants into a fresco that is both art and history. We, we'll see how it goes because we, we're just starting. But that's the spirit, apply, applying citizen science to um, public history. And that can be done through social media as well. Uh, I'm running a, a Facebook participatory group in which we try to do research together, not only to communicate history, not only to share memories about the past, but also to do research together with people, <clears throat> excuse me, who've been there, people who have witnessed things, people who have memories, people who have objects, people who have stories. And I, I'm a true believer that social media can be tools and should be tools to do participatory public history. So as you can see, there are many opportunities to, to do good digital public history. But again, we were uh, a few voices in an ocean of, of opinions. And sometimes it's good, but sometimes it's, it's ideolog ideologically wrong. And we need to be heard. We need to be better at uh, occupying the public sphere. How do you perceive the evidence in public history nowadays? in the context in which we live with waves of denial. I think the advance of public history is mostly twofold. One is training. I think there is a demand for more, perhaps better, I would say better, uh, history training. And this is, I believe, why public history has been quite popular in the last 10 to 20 years. That's because teachers, historians, professors have discovered that we need to train our students better. And there are more and more public history courses, public history programs in universities that connect with local groups, with museums, archives, with uh, video producers. More and more colleagues and historians understand that our students need to be good historians, but they also need to master the technology. They also need to be able to speak in public. They also need to be able to write text for a museum. And this is something you need to learn. You know, it's very difficult for, I would call it traditional historians to write text for a museum because they usually write too much, right? Uh, so we need to be trained in doing public history. So public history programs, public history training is I think something that's gonna develop even more. And in Brazil, you, you've had many courses the, you know, with the first seminar in I think 2011 or 2012, it's been very popular. And now you have books, the, the last book of public history in Movimento, is like a publica in Movimento, is, is, is very impressive. And I've been using um, the, the book, uh, what public history do we want, which is in Portuguese, but also in, in English. So, You've been doing this. It's a very active field in Brazil, and I believe that's going to uh, spread even more. In, in Latin America, you have new courses in Argentina, in Chile, uh, in Bogota. You, you have new, new ones in, in China. So this is the training is something that can help us convince colleagues, but also partners that we need to um, we need public history. I also think, um, and this is connected to the second part of your question. I also think we need more international connection to, to relate that to um, the, the use of the past in the political denial, we could call it denial, or simply the propaganda or instrumentalization of history. But there is a you know, strong context in Brazil. Um, I'm not going to spread too much time on, on Brazil, but you also have examples in, in Poland, uh, you have examples in China, you have examples in the United States. I, I was there um, you know, for, for, for a long time and, and the political context you know, also in, includes some, some pressure on, on historians. So it is, it is not a local context. This is not a local phenomena. You have populism uh, and a rise of populism. And those populist and sometimes authoritarian regimes are very often connected. Uh, they are very, very often in touch. 
we should be in touch too. I mean, I mean we should connect uh, Estonian public, Estonian public history from from Poland, from from China, from India, from Brazil, from the United States, to also synchronize our answer. How can we answer? Uh, political uses or political revisionism or political instrumentalization of the past. This is not a local phenomenon. We should connect and also to, to be stronger. And that connects to the first, my, the first part of my answer too. The more we train our students, the more they would be capable and equipped to answer denial, revisionism, instrumentalization, ideological use and political use of the past. We need tools. Doing a good history is not enough to convince uh, you know, the, the large number of people who believe in this denial. Communication is one tool. We need to be better at reaching those people, at communicating in you know, non-academic ways, avoiding jargon, avoiding long text and footnotes. This is not how we're going to convince people that you know, uh, the, the coup was a coup and, and not uh, you know, and not order in Brazil. So th there is a, a need to be better at communicating, reaching out people, and to connect uh, which, which, which is other. Because, and I think this is one point that uh, denial and people who you know, uh, claim revisionism uh, claim is that you know, history is one opinion, right? That uh, it is only one opinion. It's not, um, it's not the only opinion. And I, I think people do not know enough about what history is and how historians work and, and the methodology and that not everything is valid. You can't say everything about the past. There, there, there's a methodology, there are sources. It's a, it's a science. And, and for the, the, the public, there is a, a lack of understanding also because historians do not share how they work, right? We don't show people how we work. Uh, the fact that uh, writing a, a blog or blog post is maybe the final step of months of research, going to the archives, interviewing people. But people see only a page on the internet and a page, another page, they don't see all the work involved in that. So I think we, we, we have to be better at explaining, at, at showing that involving people in the, in the process of doing history. That may help showing people that history is not opinion and that we um, need to have a, a valid and scientific understanding of the past. So this is something not connected to one specific context, but being together, connecting different public historians or public history projects could help us being stronger in face of, of Politics, often but not only political actors who are very good at um, at communicating those very simple uh, opinion of the past. Professor, do you believe that shared authorities have been recognized by the public and academic and historians, or is there still a lot to be developed? It depends very much the context. It depends very much whom you are talking. Um, I, I would perhaps start with uh, academics. Uh, Ten years ago, shared authority, public history was um, not known. I mean, it's still pretty much unknown by, by many historians, but uh, 10 years ago, nobody talked about public history. Nobody talked about shared authority. And, and many people were skeptical and historians were skeptical about sharing authority. Why would you share authority with people who just remember or people who may be wrong or people who have, you know, basic knowledge of, of history. Why should I share something? I'm an historian, I've been trained in historian, I have a doctorate. Why should I share authority with, with people? I think the situation is, is changing and more and more historians, more and more scholars, and not only historians, archeologists, sociologists, anthropologists, folklorists, uh, we, we call them public humanities. It's, it's going beyond history. It's, it's, uh, it's a sort of democratization of uh, knowledge production. So it's not only history, it's way behind. To some extent, these terms have been late. Uh, archaeologists, folklorists, anthropologists, they have been working with people for you know, decades. Um, so to some extent, these terms are late in jumping on the wagon. But still, it's part of a bigger process of democratization and, and, and public access to, to knowledge. So I think we, we are making progress. This is, this is good. 
Some people are still skeptical about public history, and that's perfectly fine. There are many debates about public history, about pressure, about consulting, about working for someone. This is very, you know, ethically, this is very difficult. But uh, I think we're making progress in showing that public history is useful and has some, um, I wouldn't say answers, but have some assets, especially for the young generation. So I think this is something um, we're making progress with. But there are still many debates about um, share authority. Share authority is a very nice concept that comes from oral history, Michael Frisch in the 1990s and oral historians. They share authority by definition because you need two people to do oral history. You need a narrator and you need an interviewer. So you, you know, without the narrator, there is no oral history. So the, the share authority is pretty clear. But when you do a, an exhibition, for example, the share authority is much less clear, right? Curators do not need to share authority with, uh, with the public. I mean, there is visitor engagement, but it's not sharing authority. So I think people start accepting share authority, but there is a lack of understanding. Share authority is becoming like a buzzword, like, oh, we need to share authority. We need participation. And you know, participation today equals uh, money because for every grant application, for every uh, fundraising, you need participation, right? But people um, sometimes misunderstand what, what share authority in public is and, and participation is. It's not simply, oh, I do something and I'm gonna um, share it with the public at the end, right? It's a process. Sharing authority is negotiated. Some people refuse. Or whom do you share authority with? Right? Yesterday I had a talk uh, in, in France and the question was, do you share authority about the history of World War II with a neo-Nazi, right? So where, where do we stop? Where do you stop? Uh, do you work with everybody? No. So there is a, a misconception about share authority. We, we choose people we wanna work with. In our history, you choose people you want to interview. So there, there are some shared values behind that. And we need to be aware of those shared values. It's perfectly fine not to work with no Nazi, <laughs> but you need to be aware of what it implies for your work and what the, the, what the values you want to develop and fight for are. Because if you don't acknowledge those values, then you, you, you silence part of the share authority that, that you're doing. Um, so whom do you work with and who decides? Share authority is a great concept, but in the end, who decides? If you do a, an exhibition, you do co-creation, who's gonna decide? Uh, the curator, because the museum wants to have the final word. The community, because it's a native community and we want to you know, give them the possibility to accept or not the exhibition. So who decides? That there is no one solution, but the decision, the discussion about who gonna decide should be part of the first step of the project. Because if we don't do that, how do we solve conflict? How do we solve the multiple interpretation of, of the past? And if you share authority, you're gonna have multiple interpretation of the past. That's what we're asking for. But how do you include the different interpretation of the past? Do you accept all interpretation of the past? Right. So this is you, for every public history project, you need a list of good ethical practice that you're going to discuss with your partners. So share authority is not simply a nice word that you're going to add to your project. It's something that impacts the whole project. And if you're not prepared to accept the consequences of share authority, you, you can very easily get into trouble because you pretend that you share authority, but in the end, you're the only one you know, deciding what the exhibition or what the podcast or whatever project it is will be about. So this is something that we, we, we need to, uh, to discuss. The first part of your question was about, um, does the public accept share authority? And that's actually a good question because we often ask ourselves, do we want to share authority as, as historians? The public <laughs> does not really ask uh, the, the same question. Sometimes, the public and the different groups do not want to work with historians um, because they don't think that historians have the um, legitimacy to do their own history. There are many examples of, uh, for example, 
witnesses, like, like veterans, who do not want historians to do their history because the veterans believe in, they may be right, but they own their history. So they would never accept that an historian, external historian, come and tell them their history. So in many examples, the publics do not want historians to, uh, to be there. So the share authority is not something we, you know, that, that good and, and professional historians would accept. Sometimes we have to fight to be in, in projects. And sometimes the public uh, does not even accept this kind of elite because there is also the, this crisis of historians are part of the system. Historians are part of the uh, corrupted system. Historians are part of the elites, right? And, and, and communities want to get rid of elites. You've, been, you've, you've seen that trend in, in many countries in which uh, professional historians are seen as disconnected from the real people, right? And in, in, in some examples, Groups do not want to work with, with the elites. They want their own historians. They don't want someone working in, in universities, someone corrupted by the system or by you know, uh, this um, liberal system, as they, as they say in, in the US. Sometimes I was seen because I work in, in universities as a liberal. And some people didn't want, you know, did not want to work with me because I was supposedly a, a liberal from the university, uh, a leftist, to be, uh, to be more simple. Uh, so sharing authority is not simply, you know, scholars accepting to work with people. It's also building trust, building good relationship with people who, whom you may disagree with, you know, politically or economically or for whatever reason. It, it, takes, it takes time. So again, we should not underestimate what uh, sharing authority means. It means a lot of commitment. It means a lot of trust building. Uh, last, last week, I was in a workshop, participatory workshop, to do history with local inhabitants. But where I live in Luxembourg, there are many different languages. Uh, Luxembourgish is one language. I do not speak it yet. I speak French. But some people in, in the workshop did not want to speak French because it's also the language of, of, the, of the neighbor, the, the, of the powerful neighbor. And for them, Luxembourgish is, is, and they're perfectly right, is a symbol of identity and they want to keep it. And it's under the threat of bigger languages like English or German or French. And it took me, for a two hour workshop, it took me 90 minutes uh, to talk to one person who kept you know, speaking in, in Luxembourgish and I couldn't understand. So it took me a, I mean, a lot of time, like 90 minutes, but <laughs> sometimes it's in, it's in months, right? Especially when you work with, uh, native uh, communities who, I mean, trust building is, is key. So behind share authority, you have something that is not who say, but it's not history, it's trust building, but it's part of, uh, of, of the history making. If you don't have those skills, not only communication, but project management, management trust building, then you can't do participatory. Uh, public history. So I, I think this is both very challenging, especially for, for students, because all of a sudden they say, oh, I need to learn history and I need to learn how to make a podcast. I need to learn how to build trust. This is overwhelming because sometimes we ask them too much because we keep the same uh, requirements methodology, research, reading. But on top of that, now we ask them to make a podcast. So I think we also need to reinvent how we teach, how we train, and what we expect from students, because we, we are expecting a, a lot. And, but in the end, I think this will be, it's going to take years, but it will be very useful because we're going to train students who are going to be good historians and be able to be heard in the public sphere, they're going to be uh, capable to enter denial uh, or ideological use of history, and will be also capable to, to discuss with other experts like computer scientists or uh, theater people or, or, or video and, and movie. Um, so they, they need skills to be able to connect with new people and to be more powerful on the, in the public sphere. So going back to your question on share authority, I think this is the tree that hides the forest. The share authority is, is, a, is a nice concept, but only one way to reach even bigger questions like, like trust or participation or, or ethics. 
So I think we're making progress, but it's only the beginning of a long, uh, long process.